like that one a lot. Along those lines, anyway, we're we're live. Hey guys, welcome. Hello, this is John and Mark. Masano is with me. Hey, hey Mark. Great to see you. Yes, great to be back. And uh, this is Wake Up or Else. We are a Christian fellowship for the Truther community, and we provide a biblical analysis of the Mandela effect, among other things. And we are back after a little bit of a hiatus. Um, I think it was about two months, and we're back for the duration, Lord willing. Uh, we do have it in our hearts to be here every Thursday and Saturday at 7 p.m. Mark has committed to join me in this journey, and uh, we're very um, animated. Would you say that's a good word, Mark? Animated? <laughs> oh, yeah. That, we that's, have a, some, that's a great description. <laughs> we have some incredible conversations pretty much every day now. And, you know, we're like, man, we just got to do this live. This is such. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to take the book and we're just going to go into the beginning of the book and just riff on it. Um, I'll, I'm going to share some subscriber posts because uh, there's so many so many incredible smart godly people that are listening to us and it's very humbling i gotta be honest and so uh we'll we'll look at those and then also different things just to, intriguing us as we go through our truth or journey in general you know, the simulated sun, the reptilians, whatever is, you know, after the millennial reign, whatever is happening out there, we're going to be talking about it. But our primary focus, what the Lord has put us onto is, you know, what Mark and I feel is relevant is an understatement. Mark, how do you, how do you gauge the importance of what we're talking about? If you were to ask me 10 years ago, even seven years ago, I, I, I would never have even been able to conceive of something like this. Yeah. Reality seeming to be morphing, you know, around us. And if that wasn't enough, the Bibles are changing and everybody hates us because of it. <laughs> yes. Yes. We're not winning any popularity contests, at least among the unconvinced, I will say, um, I just did the first talk uh, that I've done in a while on um, understanding conspiracy with um, Paul, who we just love. We love Paul. Mm -hmm. And I think the last time I looked, the, that video got 15,000 views and like 500 comments. And 98% of it was positive. So I was really, really excited uh encouraged because that's a new topic for his community and there were and i'm going to share some of the, the testimonies a lot of the folks were kind of like this i knew that was happening yeah so it's kind of for a lot of believers that are on the truth or journey this bible change topic has been sort of on the edge of, of their awareness fringe a fringe topic right and so what the Lord's putting it on our hearts to do is really, you know, focus on this almost exclusively and get down into the weeds with God. And what and that's really the purpose of the book. Uh, the book is now a bulwark against virtually every objection. It's 540 pages. So it's really the culmination of our seven year journey uh, of, you know, trying to wrap our heads around this from all the different angles. And, uh, you know, what you'll see tonight as we go through things, something will come up and I'll say, oh, that's that's in there. Let me look it up. And I'll be like page 223. And then we go there and it's all laid out. So that's how this book will be a resource for you. You know, aside from just reading it. It's going to be something that you can use to respond to people because basically we, see, we, we hear the same arguments over and over. 
You're misremembering. You're delusional. You're confusing it with misquotes from pop culture, confabulation, implanted thought. You know, the Bible can't change. The human memory is unreliable. So all of those things are treated with some detail in the book, right? So you can, it's got a table of contents and you can do it anymore. So I said, I'm quitting. And uh, I offered this, I went to Panera Bread, I came back and I offered this prayer. God, if, if you want me to be faithful to this Bible thing, I'll do it, but I'd rather just go get rich. So I flipped open the Bible and the, the scripture that was highlighted said, the faithful man will abound in blessing, but he that hastens to be rich will not go unpunished. Now, I don't recommend that you get your leading from God uh, by flipping open the Bible. However, God knew at this point in my life, I was a smoldering flax, basically. I didn't have two weeks of persevering in prayer and fasting in me. This was really a Hail Mary prayer. Well, on the opposite page that was also one passage was highlighted. It was a scripture that talks about the don't change the Bible. It was unbelievable. It was so specifically tailored and it was highlighted by my mother 20 years ago. Hmm. So some of you heard the testimony that I had where I, I did fast and pray for two weeks and God spoke to me audibly. Well, what he told me that time was I've called you to be a worship leader to the body of Christ, and if you leave, you'll miss it. I was praying about leaving the country and going to Uruguay. I actually went to Uruguay to check it out. I was serious. Well, I didn't want that answer from God, so I ended up praying another two weeks and asked God to tell me in an audible voice that I should go to Uruguay. That's in contradiction to what he just told me. And of course he did. A lady walked up to me at 6 a.m. in the morning and told me in my ear, I think you should go to Uruguay. It's an incredible testimony. <laughs> well, I had enough sense to know that the first time he spoke to me was him. So now I prayed a third two weeks. God, was that you that said, don't go? And so he doubled me over again. I heard in my spirit, this scripture reference, Second Corinthians or Second Kings three something, I forget what it is. But I didn't have a Bible, so I run home. I open the Bible, and it says, "Didn't I say go not? Did I not say go not?" I was like, "I'm good. <laughs> I'm good." Well, from that experience, I made a vow, and I said, "I will never second guess you again." If you speak to me and I know it's you, I will not second guess you. So I got arrested by God and, and brought into this thing. And I have been revolutionized. And I, it's, it's, it's an example of that passage, Mark, that says, the voice of the Lord is over many waters. The mm -hmm. voice of the Lord breaks the cedars of Lebanon. Mm -hmm. One word from the King of glory will change you. So I'm now f full of energy and focus. I mean, all of that angst and stuff was blown out and I am on fire for this thing and we are just forging forward. So, how I, I should say, however, I lost my finger, okay? See that? That's my index finger on my left hand. I'm a guitar player. Very upsetting. I had written four albums worth of Christian music. That was my really, my goal, my calling. Uh, and so I have been disobedient to that s very specific word from God. I have not been leading worship. I was doing it on the prayer meetings, but um, I also was challenged by God in this project as I was speaking. I know I was listening to myself and I was saying you can't separate the demonstration of the gospel from the preaching of the gospel, right? The whole message of the Supernatural Bible Change book is we have, many of us have fallen into or succumbed to an intellectual Christianity, 
We have exchanged a, a prophetic, visceral love affair with the living God for scholastic achievements and um, endless Bible studies and activity and talking. All we do is talk. And so I was listening to myself and God was like, hello, McFly, how about you? So what I instantly realized and knew is that I had to begin to, to believe God publicly for miracles. And then God began to show me how in the Bible things were resolved with power encounters. So I think it's 1 Corinthians 4. There was some people that were, were jumping bad with Paul. They were like, you know, talking junk. Cry. What do you call it? Talking smack. They're talking <laughs> smack about Paul. And Paul goes like this. Well, when I come over there, we'll, we'll see if they got any power. Because the kingdom of God is not in word. It's in power. And so where God is taking the Mandela affected is into the, into the fiery, the fires of revival. <laughs> Hallelujah. And so on that note, what I, I'm going to play a, uh, I recorded this today. It's just a, a hymn because this is in the public domain. There's no copyright on this song. So I don't have to have a CCL license to play this. And I just want to invite the Holy Spirit into yeah. what it is that we do. Okay, and then we'll come back and we're going to pray and we'll get into our talk tonight. All right. Thy will and 
thy rich promises in me fulfilled. Lord, I need thee. Lord, I need thee. Every hour I need thee. Oh, oh, oh. Bless me now, my Savior. I come to I come to thee, Lord. Lord, 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 Sing to you. Would I sing to you? Would I lift my voice of praise? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, 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 no. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. How, Lord, how manifold are your works. In wisdom has you made them all. The earth is full of your riches. And there is none holy as you, Lord, none in all the earth, none besides thee. There is no one like our rock. Father God, right now, as your presence is here, I just lift up every need before your throne, all those that I've spoken to over the week, so many, Lord, that are just in life and death struggles with their own souls, with their bodies, with their finances. Many have children who have gone astray, who are in terrible, seemingly impossible situations, but you are the great God, Jehovah. Your arm is not too short that it cannot save. Hallelujah. So I lift up every single person of the sound of my voice and I pray for, first of all, I pray that you would begin to confirm your word with signs following. Even as we are just speaking, Lord, that, that you would begin to visit all those under the sound of our voice, that you would begin to confirm your word with signs following. You are the God of covenant and I invoke that covenant over these live streams from this day forward. I invoke God over these meetings in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. I pray for my friend who is in Canada who has a back issue, and right now I pray for a divine healing. I pray for a creative miracle in the back of that person who is a dear friend. Right now I ask the Spirit of God to go to them. And for anyone else that has a back issues, which are debilitating, I pray for creative miracles to be released. I pray for the fire of God to fall on people as they listen and they begin to laugh and cry and come under conviction and then healings begin to break out in every corner, in every place, in the car as you're driving, in your room where you are, that the Holy Spirit 
would begin to visit you. And miracles would begin to break out as we speak. And then those who experience those things would call in or they would post that in the chat and we'll have them call in and testify as it is written, declare among his people his doings. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. We do everything for your glory, Lord. Help us to hide behind the cross. God, help us that we would give you the glory. We bind every attack, every assignment of the enemy in Jesus' name. We plead the blood of Jesus over this work going forward. Lord, we thank you for the supernatural because the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. And as we go into this new chapter, we thank you for provision for the finances that we will need to make a loud noise about the Bible changes. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> so, hold on a second. Let me go back over here. <laughs> you know, the Bible is... It's really difficult. Let me get let me go off. <laughs> I listen to the King James Bible every morning as I'm praying. And I'm doing it to stay in the word, but it's tough. I'm telling you, it is not easy. <laughs> every 30 seconds I'm like, "Oh, you know, it's like a dagger." Mm -hmm. And I'm going to share some changes that I heard in the last couple of days. But this is who we serve. God showed himself to Ezekiel in Ezekiel 126. He saw Jesus, okay? And so the Jesus that you serve is much bigger than the book. Mm. I'm not proposing we're departing from the scriptures, okay? I'm just saying if we're, you know, if we're going to acknowledge that this is happening, we're going to have to formulate a response to this. And if the Bible is becoming difficult to deal with, then... We're going to have to get a revelation of who this Jesus is and get walking with him. Okay, so Ezekiel 1 26 above the expanse over their heads was what looked like a throne of sapphire. And high above on the throne was a figure like that of a man. I saw that from what appeared to be his waist up looked like glowing metal. As if full of fire. And that from there down, he looked like fire. <laughs> and brilliant light surrounded him, like the appearance of a rainbow in the clouds on a rainy day. So was the radiance around him. And then in Revelation 1, 14, we hear this. So that was Ezekiel. This is John the Revelator. His head and hair were like white wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace. And his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand, he held seven stars and out of his mouth came a sharp double edged sword. His face was like the sun shining in its brilliance. This is the God that we serve. He is great and he is mighty and he is coming to give you aid, dear soul. Whatever it is that you are going through, there is an upholding hand that can carry you like he did to me. I was done, okay? I was literally un incapable of functioning because of the heartbreak, the, the, the torment of lost, losing my children especially. And, and one word from God. And here I am. I wrote a book. <laughs> I wrote a 540-page book, and got it. I'm getting it published, and it's for free. That was the other thing. God told me, I want you to go out. Here, let me show you. I got the scripture right here. I want you to go out and not take any kind of purse with you. Remember that scripture? Hold on. Uh, so I had, uh, I had invested quite a bit into a shopify account and uh you know how to do it and i created a private vitamin line oh where is that scripture 
It's got to be up at the front here. Give me one second. I really want to see this. How does that happen? I guess it's it disappeared. All right, so Jesus told the disciples, when you go out, t don't take a bag, don't take anything with you. And when I read that, I was like, oh, okay, all right. I, I, uh, okay. So I, I just canceled that whole thing. So I don't, I'm not going to, you know, when you are a content creator, typically what you have to do if you're not independently wealthy, is you have to upsell. You have to you have to write books and sell them, or sell vitamins. I mean, that's what a lot of people do. They sell vitamins, or so. So this chapter, I'm not selling anything to you, people. Okay, it's it's just you. It's you and me. It's us together in this. And so, uh, why am I saying all that? I can't remember. <laughs> Isn't that terrible? I can't even remember what I was going to say. All right, so the book is available on the website, Wake Up or Else. Go to uh, the front of the page, looks like this, and you just hit the, uh, the blue button there, free download. It'll take you to this page. You can actually download both of my books. Just hit the blue download button, and you will be able to get those. And uh, uh, the, ne the new one will be available if you want a hard copy probably in a week or so on Amazon. All right. All right, so here's a couple of Bible changes. I'm going to share some changes uh, each week every time we get together. The first one's Matthew 7, 27, 38. I'm sorry. And these two are just weird. In Matthew 27, 38. Then were there two thieves crucified with him, one on the right hand and another on the left, and they that passed by reviled him, wagging their heads. Now, I did a review in the first part of the book where I compared three different books that were written in the King James vernacular to what we're seeing in our King James, stuff like this. Because what the unconvinced will tell you is, oh, that's just King James language. Well, no, it's not, because these other books were King James language. And they had words, I, I literally found the same words that are in the King James that are weird in these other books, and they weren't weird. So I, I mean, that's the best I could do to show, no, the Bible is actually being changed and these other books aren't. All right, then you have Matthew 27, 44, the thieves also, which were crucified with him, cast the same in his teeth. Anybody want, anybody want to respond to that? Mark? Well, I hate to say it, but I actually remember Matthew 27, 44, because when I first got saved, I watched a YouTube video, and the guy was claiming that the gospel of Matthew and the gospel of John were legitimate gospels and the gospel of Mark and the gospel of Luke were illegitimate. And that was one of the scriptures that he used as a proof text. So the other one, I'm not sure. Um, the other one doesn't look familiar to me, to me at all. Matthew 27, 38, but I do remember Matthew 27, 44. Hey, let's respond to great balls of fire. He says, crazy. This is still going on. I haven't watched this for over a year and it's exactly the same as when I left. It seriously feels like this has absorbed people's entire lives. You think? Hmm. You think it hasn't absorbed people's lives? Well, the only, the only way that you could minimize the impact of the Bible supernaturally changing without the majority of Christians knowing is if you don't believe it's happening. It's the only way that you could minimize this as being ir irrelevant, right? Mark, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, let's respond to that. <clears throat> One of the characteristics of God is he doesn't like waste. You know, where to account for every idle word, right, on the day of judgment. And if you take a look, generally speaking, at people that are in the world, a lot of what they do is it's without profit. It's meaningless. Like, you know, mm -hmm. you've said, let's let's work on our landscaping. And I'm not saying that if you work on landscaping, it's always the worst thing. But if you prioritize that in your life over God, now we're talking about idolatry. So I think a lot of people who use that type of a marginalization argument, 
what they're really saying is the things of the world are more important than the things of God. Bottom line. All right. So great bowls is qualifying. No, I mean, this chat routine has absorbed people's lives. Well, I mean, this is for, I know for myself, the chat is a lifeline. This is as close as we get to fellowship. I get calls from people where they will literally reach out to me and say, look, I know you're busy. You know, is there any way you can talk to me? And I, I have people who say, I haven't talked to anybody in two years about any of this. And so they'll get on and they'll just go for like 10, 15 minutes. I'll just be like, uh-huh. And just listen, because I know how awful it is, how isolated. So the, the chat is just like nirvana, man. It's like, you know, you're, you're finally able to just say what's in your heart and be accepted, basically. All right, give, let me give you another one. This one I heard yesterday, and I, was, I had to stop the, the recording. It's, let me play that again. This is Psalm 17, 7. I'm sorry, verse 8. I'll read verse 7 first. Shoo, shoo thy marvelous loving kindness, O thou that savest by thy right hand, them which put their trust in thee from those that rise up against them. Keep me as the apple of the eye. Hmm. Hide me under the shadow of thy wings. Does that, does that hit you wrong or is it just me? It's amazing how you can change one word like that and, 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 and it can change the whole feel of the scripture. But if I may, let, let, let's just go back to that, to that point about talking because, you know, you said it earlier, the intellectual pursuit of God and the scholarly pursuit of God. And I think, you know, if you look at this in the big picture, what are we trying to do here? We're not just sitting here, you know, commiserating about the word, the apple of thee or the apple of my eye changing to the apple of the eye. We're, we're talking about, we're talking about the health of our people, you know, Nehemiah style, God, my father and my father's house have sinned against you. My people have no walls and we're coming out of their system. And that's what this is all about for me. Amen. And we're in a similar way. We're validating the perceptions of everybody listening because all of all there's all different levels of people where they are in this journey and some people are really freaked out and they're like am i nuts um is this really true you know and, and we're here very confidently you know speaking like it's an absolute certainty to us which it is and that's very comforting so we're, we're here to minister to the Mandela Effect community. This is a mm -hmm. fellowship. This is a Christian fellowship. It's a crisis hotline. It's a place where you can, we can cry on each other's shoulders. And then we can be instructed and encouraged and we can sense the presence of the Lord. We are a blatantly Christian fellowship. Mm -hmm. We talk about Jesus incessantly. <laughs> <laughs> I remember when I went to church, the, when I first got born again, I remember thinking, these people talk about Jesus all the time, man. <laughs> all right, this one's interesting. Psalms 35. Lord, how long will thou look on? Now, look at, look at this sentence. How long will you look on? And then there's a question mark, and then the next word isn't capitalized. Hmm. That's, that's a grammatical error anyway. Rescue my soul from their destructions, my darling from the lions. I don't know about you, but these just jump out at me. All right, now those are just silly changes, but this one is probably the worst doctrinal paradox I've found yet. This is now, for me, this is now number one. Maybe Jesus slaying those that won't follow him is probably still one, but this one's number two. <laughs> Hebrews 6, 1 in the King James Bible. Mark, do you want to read it? Therefore, leaving the, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on into perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. Right. And this goes on to, to talk about other things that are 
elementary principles of Christ. They're, it's like, okay, we've gotten, we've gotten through the basics. We're going to move on. Well, most of the other translations still say the elementary principles. Mm. It's an adjective, I think. Is that right? It's an adjective. Mm -hmm. it's, it's modifying the principles. It's, it's saying we're going to move on, not from all the principles, just the elementary ones. All right, well, now that word has been removed. And so now what you have in your King James Bible is a scripture that instructs you to leave the principles of the doctrine of Christ. <laughs> We're not splitting doctrinal hairs here. We're not cherry picking, you know, uh, uh, anomalies that are here and there in the Bible. This is so blatantly um, happening because the King James Bible which is supposed to be perfect and flawless, is now telling you, for instance, if I'm an LBGT or I'm a Satanist or a, a liberal, you know, atheist preacher, I could take Hebrews 6.1 and have a field day. I could convince my congregation that we should not be listening to Jesus anymore with Hebrews 6.1. Hmm. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ. <laughs> All right, so this right here, Mark, is why we do what we do. So no doubt. Being, we are being accused of attacking the sanctity of the scripture and sowing, you know, the confusion and unbelief. No, no, we're apologists for the truth and for God himself. Because what you're going to have to do, sir ma'am, is you're going to have to begin to defend this. This is now biblical paradox number 38. So if I sit you down in a chair, I could go through 38 of these. And your position is the Bible's perfect and flawless. It's inspired. It's delivered. It's received. And it's without error. And yet, what are you going to say when I start going one after another after another? You're going to have to say one of two things. It's a bad translation, or it doesn't really mean that. You have to go into the original. Well, after you do that 38 times in a row, the other story that you're trying to push, which is the Bible's perfect and flawless, is starting to look fairly and convincing, right? Hmm. So this, this is another... I'm not going to do these right now. This is, I'll come back to these. This is the other reason, Mark, why we are so animated is um, I did that talk with Paul and I got this one post. It says, I found you through Understanding Conspiracies Channel and hearing you talk about the real purpose is walking with God and to have a relationship with him made me realize that it's not about reading the Bible or doing religious tasks, but that he just actually wants connection. This has changed my life because it opened my eyes to his love for me, and I know he wants me, wants to hear from me. <clears throat> Sometimes we get lost, <clears throat> excuse me, in getting things right and being a good Christian and lose focus. Looking forward to watching more of your videos. Praise the Lord. Mm. So, with all due respect to people that are infuriated by us suggesting this is happening and church leaders that are going to get a hold of this book and come after me with threats of slaughter and they're going to pound their pulpit and assign me to the seventh circle of hell this person is why I do what I do and if you don't repent of your willful ignorance we're going to go around you and, and, and we have Matthew 15 as a biblical precedent to do that all right, now this is the other side of the argument. This is uh, a post that we got which says, you either believe all in all of God's words or none of them. If you think you can pick and choose which words you think were changed, then you are making yourself the authority over God's holy word. And if you believe that's true, then why would you even believe in your own salvation? <sighs> Mark, you want to... Response. Well, the first thing I noticed right there, I don't know if you, you caught this, 
I, this is the first time I've seen that comment, but notice how he, he capitalizes the, the word holy and he capitalizes the word word. And to me, that's very telling. What is he really saying there, right there? He, he is, there's a false equivocation. He's equating the Bible to being God, in my opinion, very close to it, or at least insinuating it. And if you believe that's true, why would you even believe in your own salvation? I don't know, because the Lord Jesus Christ died on the cross for my sins, according to the scripture, and he rose from the dead, and he sits at the right hand of the Father advocating for me every day. Uh, it's, it's, It's accusatory. It's not logical. It's not reasonable. And uh, I think that's the reason why we do why we do a comment like that. <laughs> well, you either believe in all of God's words or none of them. Well, I agree. I'm a Bible believer. And some of the words that I believe is Daniel 7:25 and Amos 8:11 and 2 Thessalonians 2 and Revelation 13, all of which and, and many others speak to this event where God foretold that in the last days that there would be this power and permission given to Satan or the beast, or whatever, to change times and laws. And in Amos 8, 11, it's irrelevant if Amos 8 is a future prophecy. What it is is a precedent. God said, I, God said, I'm going to send a famine, but not a bread, a, a famine of the word. So the Lord proved that he's willing to remove his word from his people as a judgment. Now, it may have meant that he wasn't going to speak through the prophets anymore. And there's another passage that I think it's 1 Samuel 3. It says, in that day, the word of the Lord was rare. So, but, but that's the God we're serving, that he does take his word away as a judgment. So the, it, it's not unbiblical to suggest that this could be happening. And I show that in the book. I show about seven or eight different judgments, the, the nature of which were him removing his word. So this would be t number nine that he's doing this. <laughs> if he's doing it again, which he is. You know, you the, post before, the, the post before, the post before, I just want to touch on this a little bit because... This was beautiful, okay? And, and, and this person, Sabrina, I assume she's a female, she points to the religious tasks. Mm. Okay, that's the, that's the 501c3 American church writ large, right? And they're putting God in a box. See, now if we go to the next post, God's words, okay? And we've analyzed this to death, but... The, the word word in the New Testament logos and the word word mostly used in the Old Testament debar it, it's it's a big picture sentiment of God's eventuality God's plan God's purposes we're not talking about the individual words it's right. just so nitty and so it, it's a religious type of pharisaical uh, I'm smarter than you and I'm more learned than you, and therefore you need to step aside and and listen to the way that what I say is true type of mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and I address this in the book. Um, I can't find it right this second, but I list about nine or ten scriptures, like the righteous man judges all things. Prove mm -hmm. all things and hold fast to that which is good. I have ten of those where... The, where God expects you to use your faculties mm. combined with the leading of the Holy Spirit, your conscience, your memory, your discernment uh, are all supposed to be engaged. And, and this idea that we're picking and choosing what we think is changed is what we're supposed to do. <laughs> we're supposed to be discerning. <laughs> And the idea that we're lifting up our, our memory above the authority of Scripture is also a fallacy. Because the devil pro prowls about like a roaring lion, whom resists steadfast. That's, we're supposed to, we're not ignorant of his devices. 
and we're supposed to know when the, there's a fox in the hen house, not be oblivious to it. And, uh, you know, go into the Bible like good Bereans and find out if this is possible because the evidence is so overwhelming that it's embarrassing. All right, let me go on. Uh, this person is classic. This is, this is the real mystery here. Okay, this person says, when I was a child, there was a huge picture of the lion and the lamb together hanging in the Sunday school. Case closed, right? This is 99% of the people who have conceded that this is happening. It was one or two examples. Bam. They didn't need a 500-page thesis to convince them. So why is that? I don't know, Mark. What do you think? Why, why is some people, because they don't have an agenda? I mean, what is it? Why just get it? <laughs> I, I think it's authenticity. I think it's honesty. You know, see, here's the problem with like the post that Sabrina did. It's so simple, right, about walking with God and having a relationship with God. And if you want to create a name for yourself, you're probably not going to be able to do it preaching that type of a simple message. Because yeah. you know what? The, the, the world is going to reject it because there's nothing fun or exciting about it or new or whatever. Like, there's no hook. OK, mm -hmm. um, and if you're going to, uh, you know, shirk aside or you're going to minimize that picture on the wall, you can it's almost like you can use the Bible as a tool to beat those over the head that might not be <laughs> as learned or they may not have the intellectual faculties that you do. And that's what you really want. That's the problem. No question. No question. All right, this one is interesting. People are stupid enough to believe stupid psyops and remember references instead of originals. Now, I wanted to put this one on here as a teaching moment because you're going to see this a lot where you get this one, what I call a one level argument. It's a superficial argument. Let me let me pull this up in the book because this. This is very common. P-S-Y-O-P. All right, so what they're suggesting is that we're confused by a government PSYOP. Okay, so this is what I wrote in the book. This is on page 455. What's funny about the government PSYOP idea is that anyone making it would have to be a 33rd degree conspiracy theorist kook nutjob. I'm quite certain that the majority of rational souls who have ever uttered these faithful words would shudder to consider themselves in such an ignoble fashion. I've heard preachers say that those who claim the Bible is changing are deceived by government psyops. My response is, how? How are we deceived by a government psyop? Usually when this hypothesis is offered, there's no explanation for how it could be carried out. When I see this kind of irresponsible treatment of this important topic, I always feel that there is a genuine lack of integrity being displayed. In other words, the preacher or the person knows that the majority of believers don't believe the Bible's changing, and they don't want to believe it. He knows there's a strong bias against it, and he knows that all he has to do is throw any scrap of red meat on the floor, and all of his followers will pounce on it without doing any research on their own. There's no need to provide any kind of well thought out argument. It's enough to just inject any seemingly plausible causation and it will be accepted en masse. When they try to suggest that they have used Photoshop tricks on the Internet, we point out that the changes to our reality exist in the real world as well. So we ask, are you saying that the government went around and changed all the signs on the JP, JC Penney stores? Because what we all remember, J.C. Penney spelled without the E. Did the government change all the Ford logos on the engine blocks of every Ford automobile in the world? Because we all remember it without the little pigtail. And there are a lot of mechanics and classic car enthusiasts who would stake their lives on that one. At that point, they have no further explanation and the narrative stops as they move to an alternate theory. So there you go. That's my response to the PSYOP argument. It's preposterous. And see, a lot of their arguments are one level arguments. 
It's an implanted thought. Let's do that one real quick. Well, I can clear this up, Mark. This is just implanted thoughts that you get and then you fixate on it. Well, you know, like the Monopoly guy and the Platter's Peanut guy. Well, the problem with that argument is that you would have to have a surrogate for every Mandela effect. Okay, in other words, the planter's peanut guy is the surrogate. That's what they're suggesting we're confusing the monopoly guy with. Okay, well, I remember mirror, mirror on the wall. So do, is the planter's peanut guy confusing me about that also? No, there would have to be another movie that says magic mirror which is what it's always said. Or no, I'm sorry, there would have to be another movie which says mirror, mirror, and, and that, that would confuse me, but that doesn't exist. See, so the, these arguments are very superficial. They, they just throw them out there and they sound very lofty, but when you actually drill down on it and write a book about it, it really is, uh, there's nothing there, okay? Uh, all right, so this post is so glad I listened to this. I almost didn't. All right, so I picked this one because this this one really speaks to our journey and, and the, the pathos of the truther. So they said, I almost did as I've been down this road many times and understand it. But what I didn't, what I needed to hear was the discussion about the losing those, losing those around you and being seen as crazy over all this exactly what I've been dealing with for the last four years and seeing all this and trying to share massive loss of friends and loved ones seen as a heretic and lost and stupid and deceived. I won't take a show of hands. I, I would almost probably be unanimous though for those of you who could commiserate with Sean 958. Been feeling so alone and depressed the last year over it all. Thank you for helping me. I'm, I'm not alone in this way, feeling and dealing with, with the chastening. Thank you for speaking truth and continuing to speak into the darkness. <laughs> Praise the Lord. And I, I put down here, download the Conspiracy Theorist Survival Guide. That book is also available for free. So you can get both my books for free. And I would encourage you to get that because that's what it's all about. All right, so, Solo Scriptura, uh, uh, argument. Uh, if this was true, then solo scriptura is out the window. As if it wasn't already if you're a, ra a rational All right, So this person's sort of an unbeliever, but so solo scriptura just means that the teachings of scriptures are your final authority. And you don't accept anything that contradicts the teachings of scripture. Which is what Mark and I believe. But that belief is not out the window, as you say, just because the scriptures have become inaccessible through a judgment that is either identical to Amos 8.11 or is Amos 8.11. My new book, which will be available within a matter of days, will provide you with multiple examples from the scriptures of how God removed his word as a judgment. So your reasoning is flawed. The teachings of God's word are still my final authority. They just are becoming inaccessible, or rather, they're becoming in illegible. The problem that you have is just that you make yourself smarter than God. You say that he will never allow the Bible to be changed when he has done it many times. Hmm. Many times. When you get into the book, you will see how many times God has allowed the Bible to be changed. So if God has allowed the Bible to be changed throughout history, how could you say the Bible can't change? And let's talk about solo scripture. Yes, We've had please. this conversation before because keep going. I'm going to get some water. The, the solo scripture doctrine, the way that it's teached right now, it, it, there's a Catholic influence. It's supposed to be, if you receive a revelation from God that contradicts the plain scripture, then you know you are to make the discerning the judgment that it didn't come from God. However, the way it's really teached is if you receive a revelation from God, a special revelation, and it's not in the Bible, even if it's in perfect accordance with the character of God, then you're to throw it out the window. And I think that that doctrine is just terrible. 
And uh, I think for the most part, the mainstream, we'll say Protestant church has adopted that version of solo scripture from, from Catholicism. See, John and I talk about this all the time. A lot of these terms have been co-opted. What they were supposed to mean, they no longer mean in modern day colloquialism because we've, we've been, it's been drilled into us for so long. We've accepted it as something different than it was originally intended to mean. You mean sola scriptura, that term? That term um, among many other terms. Yes. Well, that's a, that's a whole topic that we're, <laughs> we're, we're being awakened to sloppy doctrine, like the doctrine of the preservation of scripture, hmm. which in my understanding of what a doctrine is, a doctrine is something that's actually written in the Bible. However, the doctrine of preservation, which has two legs, is actually a, a supposition. It's an mm. assumption. And then the second part of it is the about seven or ten primary passages that are, are used to, to talk about preservation, which we're going to talk about here in a second. Um, Dave O. says, I've been using the Jehovah's Bible. It was always most close to KJV and is now the least affected I have found. That's cool. The Jehovah's mm. Bible. It's interesting. Let's see what this says. Just busy bird. Justine, thanks, Phil. I feel like I'm drinking from a fire hose. <laughs> I know what you mean, man. Oh, this one's interesting. Uh, B busy says Hebrews six. That's incredible. See, this is this is this is billions of people, you guys. I checked I checked the demographics on on basically the three or four main um, like Protestant denominations, Assembly of God, blah blah blah, whatever they were, Baptists. There's a billion people. Those are U.S. based denominations. A billion, and they don't know the majority of them don't know what's happening, and I am afraid that many of them are not going to know because they got their leaders have gotten a memo not to tell them. So this ministry is geared up now to confront that whole power structure. Hmm. And I have a very comprehensive argument for anybody that tries to suggest that this is a fool's errand or it isn't it isn't God's will. <laughs> I'll tell you that is I actually did a talk on it called the biblical imperative to warn the church. So mm -hmm. that idea is completely unscriptural, completely. The, uh, the premise of it is that God will only show, the only people that will see this are the ones that God will show. Well, that's not true at all. I have people that contact me. In fact, I'm not renewing my lease here and my lease is up in, in October and I'm, I'm going to be moving to an undisclosed location for the next chapter of my life. And the where I'm going is a person who was sitting watching YouTube and my Bible quiz came up on their feed and they watched it. Her and her husband watched it. They didn't ever know about the Mandela effect and they were both converted on the spot, case closed. Now I'm going to go live with them. <laughs> All right. So the idea that we, I mean, you'd have to apply that same reasoning to evangelism, right, Mark? Yeah, right. And like, I think, as I've said many times, doing this, we have to be masters of the obvious because there was a time where I didn't see this. And, you know, I had an inkling, but I really did need someone to point me in the right direction. You know, I'm sure God maybe would have shown it to me, but maybe that wasn't his plan. But the bottom line is, for whatever reason, God could come down and preach the gospel himself to people and have them get saved just through. But he uses people to speak to us. That is his his way. That's one of the ways that his modus operandi. So we're we're acting in accordance with the way that God does things with doing this. Keep talking. I'm going to try to find this uh, next thing we're going to talk about. You know, Hebrews 6, just real quick. When John showed that to me, 
I knew it was changed originally. I didn't remember exactly what it said. And then he, he, he brought it to my attention. That was such a shocker that is doing this as long as I had, I still had to open up my King James Bible and see it with my own eyes myself. So, you know, the individual that, that, that had mentioned about talking about this, think about that for a second. You know, we've been, John has been in this industry for seven years. He just wrote a 540 page book. He got divorced. His four children hardly talk to him anymore about this issue. And there can be still something that is so shocking that, uh, you know, you turn out, you open your Bible and you're like, wow, how did that happen? This isn't something that stopped happening. It's something that is continuing to happen. That's another reason that why we're, we're, we're talking about this, right? Mm-hmm. All right, I can't find it in the table of contents, so let me just do it like this. As John is looking that up, I I will also say, you know, I had an interesting discussion with a couple Christian brothers that I I really liked, and and they had postulated something about the Bible changes, which I hadn't considered previously. It was their opinion that at least with certain Bible changes— they weren't actually contrary to God's ways or God's plans. And I did think about it and consider it for a while, but I look at Hebrews 6, 1, I don't see how you can possibly say that that is something that, you know, is a good thing for God's kingdom or that God um, would, would sanction. What do you think about that, John? Do you mean, do I believe that Hebrews 6 is a biblical paradox? Yes. Absolutely. It's. I think it's probably the worst one we found so far, and I just mm. uh, got that one from somebody. It calls me a couple times a month, and they're like, "Have you seen this?" I'm like, no. It's virtually in every page. There's something changed in almost every paragraph. But like we said, some of the changes are different. Like Peter, if you ask um, like a hundred Christians, okay, describe Peter's experience with with denying Jesus and the cock crowing. How, how did that work? And they'll be like, well, he denied him and then denied him. And then so he denied him three times and then the cock crowed once. Now, that's still in the I think it's two of the Gospels. But one of the Gospels now says that he denies Jesus twice and then the cock crows thrice. So the cock. So he denies him two times instead of three. And then the cock crows three times instead of one. Now, that's very unfamiliar, but it doesn't really impact doctrine like Hebrews 6 or the other 37 biblical paradoxes that we have, like female sheep or sacrificing turtles or men be breastfeeding or vulgar things like drinking your own piss and eating your own dung is in the King James Bible. It's in the 1611 version. And see, the, the majority of Christians will admit to you, oh, you ask them, is this the first time this has ever come to your attention? And they'll have to say yes. So not only are they shocking, but they're also wildly unfamiliar. So mm. it's a double whammy. All right, but we wanted to try to talk about this topic in the last few minutes here tonight. And Mark, you're going to be able to stay on until nine. Is that right? I can stay on as long as you need me to. Oh, this is okay. too important. Um, as, as I've been doing this for the last seven years, I've noticed a pattern with God where during the week, something will come up like two or three times. And I, f I feel like that's God prod prodding me to talk about it. So I believe this is the word of the Lord uh, for us that we need to have. Um, we need to put a stake in the ground for ourselves and, and try to wrestle with where we stand on this because it's a really important topic and t to be honest mark and i have been wrestling with it ourselves hmm. as we start to drill down on it we realize well i never thought of that like <laughs> you had the most incredible ideas on this today so we're going to share those uh, so the question is is not being able to perceive or acknowledge the bible changes a salvation issue because there are some, and I did a poll, and I will do a poll again here in a minute. I did a poll on this once, and it was over 70% said no. I think we had about 100 people on that, on that live stream. 
and 70 out of 100 said, no, I don't believe if you don't see or perceive the changes that it's not a salvation issue. Okay. Now, having said that, I, I broke down my position into three groups of people. And I'll just summarize it and then we'll kind of take them one at a time. The first one is the individual, not the church leader. Okay, we're talking about individuals. And, and this is a person that hasn't really just, they haven't noticed it. No one has come to them yet and actually told them about it. So they're just oblivious. All right. The second category is an individual, not a church leader or, or someone who is in a position of influence. Okay, we're going to treat them separately because the Bible says, let you not be many teachers for you shall have a stricter judgment. Hmm. The second category is the Christian who has been approached about this. They've been given examples. They've been told straight up the Bible's supernaturally changing. And here's the examples and they get them wrong and they just shake it off. Okay. But they refuse to admit that it's changing. The third group, however, is the group that actually does believe it's changing and that then they t they tell everybody it's not changing. So they basically refuse to cooperate with their own conscience. That person, I believe, is in very, very serious peril. Now, Mark, I'm going to hand it to you because I want you to start out with what you told me today because that really, it, it totally nailed it for me. The, I think it was 1 Corinthians 4 is what you said? Yeah. Yeah. So like John said, we've been wrestling this with this for a time. And I will say that there are people out there that I like, love, and respect that disagree with me or disagree with us on on, on this. Um, but I believe that, that you have to start with 1 Corinthians 4, where the Bible says judge nothing before the time, okay? Mm -hmm. And also Romans 8, 19, I believe, the whole creation waits eagerly for the unveiling of the children of God. So I think that this is bigger. This is an issue to me that is bigger than just the Mandela effect, because I think when you start putting yourself in a position to judge other believers salvation in a big picture sense, um, you're acting outside of what God has revealed is his plan. All God, all judgment has been given over to the Lord Jesus Christ. If all of creation is waiting for the unveiling of the children of God, what is all of creation? That would even include the angels. So are we making ourselves higher than angels? Mm. And I think, you know, I've been guilty of this. I think what it is, is you're, you're putting God in a box when you start presuming that certain people have their salvation. You question other people's salvation. You put yourself in a dangerous spot. And I just don't think it's the proper perspective you know, in order to do it, in order to, in order to judge us. Now the Bible also says that we're to have righteous judgment, but I don't believe it's in the context of eternal salvation. I agree. Okay. So just considering, you know, something that's God has been bringing my, to my attention when you're trying to discern the truth, I think you start with what is clear and what is straightforward. And then you go from there. And the body of Christ is so sick and, and lacking discernment right now. I think we really need to start there because we, we can't even get that right. You know, so <laughs> uh, the, the example I gave to John earlier is, you know, if your next door neighbor is engaged in an affair, you know, that is clear. It's straightforward. It's absolutely against the will of God. Adultery, it's, it breaks one of the Ten Commandments. That's a no doubter. You tell him to stop doing it. You tell him to repent, right? Yeah. Um, and I see big picture. I see Christians arguing doctrine all the time by choosing a scripture that doesn't translate well, or it's unclear. There's a ton of, there's a ton of disagreement over it as their foundational piece, instead of going to what is very clear and straightforward. So like in this particular example, you know, if we take a modern day thief on the cross, Okay, so 
I would say there are people out there who do ministry in nursing homes and their testimony is that people get saved a week before they die, a day before they die. Right. Yeah. And some of these people have never even read the Bible. So imagine this happens. They've never read the Bible. They get saved based upon their belief in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ, his, his death, burial and resurrection. They go up to heaven. They they're, they're about to be judged and Jesus is like, listen, you, you you accepted my death, burial, and resurrection, but you never picked up a Bible and saw the Bible changes. Too bad you're out. Right. I mean, can you imagine that happening? No way, right? There's no way that's going to happen. Um, and I think I'm sure maybe someone who would disagree with me might say that's an extreme example. That's an exception. But if you just extrapolate it out, there are people who are professing Christians who don't read the Bible at all. So I don't think that they saw it. There are people who read the Bible, don't read the Bible enough. Although some would say now with the, the Bible changes, we shouldn't be reading the Bible. But you understand the point. They don't they don't seek out the truth like they should. Does that mean they're not saved? Is that my position? Is that our position to judge that? I say it's not. Okay. All that being said, I have an escalating level of concern for certain Christians. Yes. You show it to them, they refuse to accept it. They take the download, as we say. My concern goes up. Then they start lying about the Bible changes and fighting against us. Like, you know, Vincent Rhodes, I know he's a leader. He claims that the person that was going to talk to him about the Bible changes in the live stream, Jesus Freak Computer Geek, didn't show up or had to work. And he wouldn't actually let him into the live stream. That's like, whoa. That's a major lead concern. Yep. Or you have leaders who know about it, who are actively denying it and trying to cover it up. I have a major lead concern. That doesn't, that doesn't mean I'm judging them, but I certainly am concerned about their salvation. So that's what I would have to say about that. Super, really good. And just to put a period on it, what you're, what you're introducing to this conversation is the idea that we got no business trying to judge people. In fact, our poster child scripture is the scripture of the day for this. Matthew 7, 1, judge not lest you be judged. <laughs> that's, our, that's our poster child Mandela effect scripture. Because um, everybody gets that one wrong. And so, you know, in a similar way, what about this question? If you think that people that can't perceive these changes have lost their souls, their reprobate, because they can't perceive the changes, does that mean that you were unsaved right up until the day that mm. you saw the changes? I don't mm. think you'd want to admit that. All right, so let me break down one of the things I think the Lord showed me about this is first of all, what Mark is saying is that our salvation is so huge. If you come under the Lordship of Jesus Christ, you have the born again experience, which is the greatest miracle, right? Jesus said, don't be psyched that the devils are subject to you. I'll tell you what to get excited about. Your name is written in heaven. Mm. And then, you know, you're translated into the kingdom of his dear son. You're translated from dark to light. You become a, 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 an heir to the throne. I mean, this is no small thing and it's all free. You have to really, really work hard to lose that i don't believe in calvinism or once saved always saved but i am i'm here to tell you that what can separate us from the love of god neither death nor life nor blah, 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 blah. it's like you mean you're going to tell me like mark was saying the thief on the cross person they get saved and a week later they die and they're going to go to hell because they didn't perceive the changes so those who say you can't you're not saved if you don't see the changes you have to you have to now factor in how long they've been saved how long after you're saved do you now lose your salvation because you don't see the changes right yeah that's yeah. tricky it, it, it it's very tricky uh, you know i think <laughs> we've been so conditioned there it seems to me that there's a big picture problem in the church of not really giving the Lord Jesus Christ the trust about being a righteous judge. I really do believe that. And I think what it all boils down to is we've been, the Lord Jesus Christ, he's the alpha and the omega. 
But the modern day church, it's all about him being the Omega. It's all about him washing our feet. It's all about him taking the lowest place. We don't see him or we've, we've been taught that he's not the alpha. He's, his judgment is, is such that he doesn't have to share with anybody what he's mm-hmm. going to do at, uh, come judgment day. And I think there's a lot of people who we don't know what's going to happen. I certainly don't know. You know, and also what you said earlier, I can speak by testimony about messing up your salvation. I'm not a Calvinist either. I think it's a dangerous doctrine, especially hyper-Calvinism. But that being said, there have been times in my life where I've messed up so bad that the only possibly the only really solution was mercy and God has given it to me when I've really needed it. Hallelujah. Otherwise I would have been kicked out a long time ago. And that's the truth. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. All right. So here's another thing the Lord showed me. I believe this is really important because God delights in a fair balance. He judges righteous judgment. So now, this is not all Christians, but I do believe that a lot are motivated by a zeal for God's honor. So they're confronted with what to them is a is like an atheist walking up to you and saying there is no God. It's almost like, you know, water isn't wet. It's a ridiculous. It's not even worth. I've had pastors tell me that this is not even worthy of me looking into. That's what they said. So they have a zeal for God's honor and that's their motivation to turn a blind eye to it. Now, the other part of this is that you can't really be mad at somebody that has a brain tumor if they're acting weird. They have, they have a, you know, they're afflicted. Well, all of humanity... <laughs> All of humanity is afflicted by uh, a lifetime of trauma-based mind control. And so I believe very strongly that the same blindness that people are suffering under regarding NASA lying to all of humanity. uh, You know, if you believe the earth is round, are you going to hell? Because I can show you very clearly that you can see 50 miles and you can see the whole building and that's impossible. And so, you, but you'll tell me that I'm crazy. And uh, the Bible says, how could you believe spiritual things if you can't receive natural things? So I could make the same case that if you can't perceive the truth about the earth being flat, then you're going to hell, which I don't think many people would uh bite down on so so then so you have to make a case then that because you can't perceive the bible changes that's different because that's god and the other thing isn't god and you should know god right isn't that the principle if you can't perceive that god is leaving his own book then you must not know him well that would be true if you weren't a victim of a lifetime of trauma-based mind control. So God, what I'm saying is God takes those two things into consideration and doesn't toss your hiney into hell just so flippantly like all these people are suggesting. He says, he looks at, and this is my child, this is a person that's worshiping God and walking a, a walk of holiness. If they're, they're seeking him in his word. They're tithing. They're going and helping people. They're living the life. They've received their their salvation 20 years ago they walked the sawdust trail i mean these are born again spirit-filled believers and you're saying that because they've been blinded by the devil in this area and because it's the word that is you know so blatantly corrupted and they can't perceive it that somehow they're not of the they're not part of the commonwealth of god anymore that's a big leap for me mark well, in this one, I have a very slight disagreement with you, okay? Take it away. Now, I'm sure that there are people who have a zeal for God, and that's why they take this position. However, generally speaking, that's not been my experience. Most of the people that I've dealt with that have have, have denied the Bible changes, especially the more emphatically they, they deny it, Often there's a root of dishonesty there, inauthenticity, 
and really a lot of times they're exalting themselves. So that hasn't been my experience. I, I hope they're, I mean, I'm wrong or there's more people I haven't come into contact. That's number one. Number two, my sheep hear my voice. Okay. So I think there is a difference between the flat earth and the Bible changes because there's an element of hearing God's voice to reading the Bible. I understand God can speak outside of uh, reading the Bible, but reading the Bible does, it, it, it contains an element of hearing God's voice. And what really scares me is that the number of people that haven't denied this and then come back and said, I was wrong. You guys were totally right. Not even you guys. This this is really the truth. We haven't really seen that. So that is very concerning to me for their spiritual health. That's what I would say to that. All right. I just put the post. I posted the uh, poll. And I just want to make sure everybody understands it. I, I was trying to figure out how to word it. So I said, is seeing the Bible changes a salvation issue? Okay. So what that means is if you believe... If you can't perceive the changes, you're not saved, you would say yes. Is, is seeing the changes a salvation issue? Yes, I believe it is. If you don't believe that you know, perceiving that is a salvation issue, you cannot see it and still go to heaven, then your answer would be no. Okay. Now, let me go to the second group because I think the second group is the most difficult one hmm. to make a, try to make a decision about if we're going to do that because uh, you know this is a person that has actually had this presented to them and i've done it a lot bunch of times now and it's always the same you know you give them all the examples judge not lest you be judged they get it wrong the lord giveth and the lord taketh away they get it wrong and they're shocked. I mean, you could see you could see it on their face. They know that something is weird, you know. And usually when you get to about the fourth or the fifth example, that's when they glitch out. They go, well, what are you trying to say? I'm trying to tell you what I told you in the beginning, that this is an end times prophecy that's happening in the Bible's change. Well, that, the Bible can't. So then they do their, their script, you know. The Bible can't change. So... But then you keep going and you stump them about eight or nine times. And now their conscience actually begins to bother them. So there's, they're like conflicted. There's two parts of them. There's the, there's the intellectual part where they can't really deny this is something unexplainable is happening. But then there's the other part of them, which is the normie part. And this is the part that I'm trying to defend, essentially. I wrote a book about normie behavior. Half of the book is called Inside the Mind of the, of the Unconvinced. And it's a very pernicious, I don't know if that's the right word, virulent. It's a very virulent mind control state to be in. It's, I mean, you've all experienced it. We're, we're stupefied by normies. <laughs> They're impervious to reason. Okay, and so it's the same mind control that is on them about the moon landing and the underground bases and the chemtrails. I mean, you could show them the state of Tennessee has now banned chemtrails, not contrails, okay? Look it up. The state of Tennessee has banned chemtrails. And you could show a normie that and s say, look, chemtrails are real. No. They'll just blah, 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 blah. They'll go off in that direction or they'll go that direction or they'll get mad or they got four or five escape routes you know what it's like but they won't they won't come out of their trance okay so what i'm saying is give these people a break don't take their salvation away because they're a mm -hmm. victim of mind control and since they're in many cases may be motivated by a noble motive they're trying to protect god's honor that's how God sees them. Now, having said that, I agree with Mark wholeheartedly that they are in an extremely perilous condition. And, and the longer they persist in their willful ignorance, of course, they immediately fall under 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 curse of willful ignorance. 
So you got that going <laughs> against you. Mm. And what I've found, you know, with my truther journey is, and I, I did a talk on this called help. I have more than 10 rabbit holes in my portfolio. So the more rabbit holes you go down, the more you can see. So the more you see, the more you see, you know, like you start your your consciousness level goes higher. Well, the opposite is true. Also, mm. if you turn a blind eye to this, initially, you know, the lights don't go out. But if you keep it up, you know, you're going to go into darkness, which is definitely perilous. You want to respond to that, Mark? You know, the Bible says your light has become darkness. Mm hmm. And I remember hearing a preacher uh, had a testimony that had that had happened to two people in his congregation. It was very scary. But also, we know that there are times when God turns over uh, someone, you know, he, he gave them over so that they can be restored. Didn't yeah. Paul turn somebody over to Satan so he could be restored? Yes, he did. So, I mean, the Lord Jesus Christ loves underdogs, right? Yes. <laughs> you know, and I, I think... I would love, one thing I'll tell you, I would love to see, I would love to see somebody who formally denied this, see the light. Maybe, maybe we could help them with that and repent. Wouldn't that be an amazing uh, testimony? What's the test? What is that? That, you know, maybe we could, we could help someone who formally denied the Bible changes you know, imagine if it was a pastor or a leader and come out and say, listen, I, I was wrong about this. You know, I read this book by John Kerwin or I saw this live stream or whatever it is, or God showed me and I'm going to reverse my position on this. I'm going to repent of what I had well, said. Sure. This was incorrect. That would be amazing. Well, you better buckle your seatbelt because that's exactly what's going to happen. <laughs> Uh, it was about three years ago. I was right over there washing dishes, and the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, the preachers are coming. Hmm. And, oh, my gosh, before I forget, I want to make a request for everybody listening to me to go to my website. This is a really important thing you can do for the kingdom of heaven. If you believe in what we're doing, uh, let me share my screen here. If you would like to help, uh, I would ask you to go to the website and click on the affidavits tab on the left, and it'll take you to this screen. And here's an explanation of this agenda. Okay, and there's two different affidavits. One is for Christian leaders, and then there's a general one. Okay, Christian leaders are pastors, church leaders, board members of denominations, Bible college stakeholders, influencers, stakeholders in Bible publishing houses, and Christian media. I don't care if they're run by the Illuminati. There's people in there that aren't that. I don't care what you think. God has put me on this mission, and he always has his witness in Babylon. Now, once I get 10 of those in hand, I already have one from Dr. Paul Holt, who has four theological degrees, including a PhD in theology, and he has written 12 theological books, academic books that are used by Bible college students, and one of his books is called The King James Bible and the Quantum Effect. What happens when I have 20 people with creds like that? That's a that's how you kick the door open. That's how you wave off the you're a kook uh, knee-jerk reaction. Now, if you're not a church leader, however, there's a, a general affidavit. And if you just download this, and once I, once I have uh, you know, some funds to do this, uh, there's a service that I can get through DocuSign. It's about 50 bucks a month. But then I can just put a link up and I'll put the I'll put the affidavit in the system and all you do is click on the link. You put in your name, your email, click the link, it's emailed to you, and then you go click, 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 and you sign it electronically, it comes back to me. 
I'm going to get a thousand of these. Now, this <laughs> one, this one, it says all statements are true. I have no history of mental illness. I do not abuse drugs and alcohol. My faith confession is that I am a born again Christian since, and then your date. I have studied the Bible for a blank number of years. This is important. I'm going to get a thousand of these. And it says my present vocation is. Now, understand, God does not look on the outward appearance. Mm. He looks on the heart. But man does. Man does look on the outward appearance. So if you don't have any credentials, that doesn't mean your affidavit is unimportant. It's very important. However, however, if you are an astrophysicist, I need you to brag about I need you to brag about whatever whatever creds you got, okay? Put it on there. If you're a doctor, a lawyer, a blah, 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 whatever it is, I need to have you put it on there because then I compile a demographic in my approach and I call the Bible school president and I get the dean on the phone and I say, Dean, we haven't met. My name is John Kerwin. I, I, I've written a book that I, I sent to you, but I just wanted to call for a, uh, an opportunity to come in and speak with you. I have, a, uh, I have 47 affidavits now from pastors and theologians and um, scholars, biblical scholars and, and authors testifying to the authenticity of the end times event where the Bible is supernaturally changing. It's imperative that I come in and talk with you. I'm going to be in your area on Tuesday. Would you be able to sit with me for just about 15 or 20 minutes? You can't blow me off like I'm a kook if I have 47 affidavits of church leaders. You follow me? Hmm. This is how the world works. So if you're not the church leader, but you have a vocation, I will compile that data as well. And, and by the way, Dean, whatever, I also have over a thousand affidavits. And among those are blank, 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 blank and I just list. And that, that's no longer some spurious data that could be fake or whatever. They can't argue with affidavits are a, a as good as gold testimony. And, and what I ask you to do, actually, is once you sign it, if you can, take it to the where you take it to your bank, and they'll notarize it for free at your bank, and then bring it home. They'll just stamp it and sign it, and then email it. There's the email at the bottom. You'll have to scan it in, and uh, then email it to me. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Run with the runners. Okay, so this idea of, of people not perceiving this, what I've heard is people try to suggest that they're reprobate. Well, uh, the uh, Bible tells you what a reprobate is. It's a very, very severe spiritual condition. I met one person in 40 years that I believe was reprobate. It was, I was never forget it. I was in New York. I was out on the street you know, going somewhere, whatever, doing ministry. And this guy was in, he had his shopping cart. He's living in the street. And I started witnessing to him. And this guy knew the word like 20 dudes. And he told me he was a pastor, but he had secret sin. And he finally gave over to it. And this is what he told me. John, I have no desire to be reconciled to God. That's reprobate. This is the three passages in the Bible that talk about reprobate. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. This is talking about homosexuality. 2 Timothy 3.8, now as Jannies and Jambres, we don't really know who they are, that's the only mention of them, withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth, men of corrupt minds, reprobate concerning the faith. Titus 1.16, they profess that they know God, but in works they deny him, being abominable. 
and disobedient. This is not the testimony of true believers who love God and are walking with him. They're not disobedient. They're not abominable. I, I mean, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. It's just, it doesn't line up with reality that the, the, the testimony of many of the people that are just haven't clued on this yet, or even if they have been approached, they've thrown it off, are not what you s see described as people that are reprobate. So to apply that to them is disingenuous. Mark, do you want to comment to that? I think, as we spoke earlier, I'm starting to feel the weight of this, of, of I really don't want to accuse someone of not being in the faith if they are, because I think that's a dangerous thing to do. I really do. Um, I had a conversation with somebody I respect about one of the leaders that's actively denying the Bible changes. And this person is, is, is really told some verifiable lies and, and th the individual that's denying the Bible changes. And the person that I spoke with who, who believes in the Bible changes, he w went out of his way to say, it doesn't mean that he's going to go to hell. I noticed it. So in other words, this, this gentleman who believes in the Bible changes, he's one of us went out of his way to tell me just because he doesn't believe it. And just because he's lying, I'm not going to judge that person. Maybe. And, and I, and I really do think that's the proper way I'm concerned. I'm certainly concerned about someone who takes the download, but I'm not going to judge before the time. I, I think that's how I feel more strongly about this now yes. after having this conversation. A hundred percent. It's, it's very perilous. Um, and it, and it definitely, uh, it, it, it take your trust level takes a hit mm. and, on that person. And then of course it creates a chasm, relational chasm, uh, between you. I mean, like, I was in a church when I found this out and I went to my pastor after I had looked into it for a while and this was a KJV only church and I had my little list of 15 changes. It was him and, and the assistant pastor and they heard me out, but it, you know, it was just like preposterous to them. It was like ridiculous. And then I made a second pass at them a couple months later and it was worse this time now they started to express their concern and you know it was like i stepped off of a pink spaceship or something they were really mm. looking at me sideways so um you you don't have a very receptive audience for mo in most cases with church leaders so let's talk about them let's talk about the pastor now who's a content expert so you can no longer suggest that he's just confused and biblically illiterate because he went to bible school and he studied the bible for 40 years and he prepares sermons i mean the guy is not confused and yet we can stump him i mean 10 out of 10 a lot of times with very familiar passages, which is impossible. So you go to that guy and he blows it off. Now, what about his salvation? Because now he's, in, he's responsible for other people. I would say, well, let me just read what I wrote in the book. Let me read level three. The third group we will explore has figuratively hit the ground at 400 miles per hour. I gave the analogy of the first group is like somebody where I, th I, I th take the only parachute on the plane and I throw it out the door in front of them. But the plane is still flying. The second group, the plane is, is in a nosedive with no parachute and it's screaming towards the ground. That's the person that's been confronted about it. This, but this group is the ones that are church leaders. And they are in a plane that has now hit the ground at 400 miles an hour. And, they're, and I say it right in the book. They're going straight to hell when they take their last breath. This is the church leader, influencer, pastor who has looked at this phenomenon, has concluded that it's authentic, 
but has made the decision to keep it from their flock. Okay, that's my only my only clear line that I'm willing to draw. If you're a church leader and you know that this is truly happening, you know the Bible is supernaturally changing, which we know there are people like that, and you choose mm -hmm. not to tell your flock, this, this chapter is for you. These unfortunate souls will be forced to lie to their followers to perpetuate the cover-up. They will use their influence to convince everyone around them that this is all just confusion and delusion, knowing full well that it isn't. Their subterfuge will typically include calling us fools and charlatans, which is a clear violation of Matthew 5.22. Whoever calls a, someone a fool should be in danger of hellfire. This decision by any church leader is an egregious abdication uh, of their moral responsibility to warn of danger. Those engaged in this type of activity have forsaken their mantle as a shepherd and have become nothing more than a hireling. They have become a premeditated co-conspirator with the mortal enemy of God. And if you are a co-conspirator with the enemy of God, what does that make you? Uh, there may be some rare occasions where it would be ill-advised to disclose this to some group of people temporarily, but generally speaking, there is no rational excuse that I can think of that can be given to justify a cover-up, especially when the reasons that drive the majority of these decisions are typically selfish, like the rich young ruler principle, or maintaining the status quo. This is a heinous crime, which I believe is damnable. I mean, let's be honest. We talked about this this idea of bright line thinking as Christians. Um, the Bible, you know, Jesus doesn't mince words. Uh, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father except through me. So our ecumenicalism only goes so far. You know, if you're, if you're a Muslim... You know, you're Buddhist, you're deceived. There's only one God. Jesus is the only one that rose from the dead. That was the proof. That's what it says in Acts. I will raise him from the dead, and by this I will show all men that he is the way. Something mm -hmm. like that. So Buddha's in the grave. Hare Krishna's in the grave. Muhammad's in the grave. Jesus rose from the grave. Hallelujah. All right, so as Christians, we, we are very dogmatic, and then... In the church, you have church government. There's, uh, there's instruction from Paul, I believe. He says, don't even eat with somebody that is given to anger outbursts. And then there's, there's church discipline where you, you, know, you confront people and excommunicate them if they don't shape up. So you know, this is a quasi-military operation. Then you have the whole teaching about separation from the world and consecration. Uh, evil com communications, corrupt good manners. So we're not supposed to, what is this saying? I don't drink and smoke and chew and I don't hang with those that do. When you get born <laughs> again, you're pretty much going to usually get all new friends. Now, having said that, the people around Jesus apparently viewed him as a wine bibber because that's what he said that they believed of him. And that was because he was the friend of sinners. So this whole idea of having this Christian hit, hit, uh, like a hitman of a mobster, like you're, you're constantly canceling people. You're cutting them mm. off. Somebody, you know, says something and that they prophesy something. It doesn't, well, they're a false prophet. No, did you, didn't you ever miss God? The idea that anybody that says a prophet, prophecy that doesn't come true was an Old Testament criteria for Old Testament prophets. Under the New Covenant, we're all, we're all given the gift of prophecy if you want to exercise it, but you have to practice. So you're going to get it wrong. You're not a false prophet. Now, you can be. You know, if you're out there constantly doing things that are wrong prophetically, you can get to a point, but it's not like... You understand what I'm saying? One, it, there's, there's this very um, kind of a trigger-happy um, sense that I get with a lot of online Christianity, a lot of the interaction 
that I see is very ruthless and, and just black and white thinking. And it lacks a lot of love. So we're not uh, excessively ecumenical, but we're evangelistic. We're uncompromising, but we walk in love and we think the best and we have grace with people. Okay? So having said that, the church leader, though, is standing at the front of the church every Sunday and he's quoting the Bible out of his mouth, which is different than what's in his Bible. We have a King James Bible. He has a King James Bible. And he's saying, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. And you're like, uh, it says charity. <laughs> <laughs> that happened to me. It says charity. So then you, you get, you, you know, so many people have told me, I, John, I just, I couldn't take anymore. I couldn't watch the spectacle Sunday after Sunday, cringing. It's a cringe event, waiting for the, for the Bible changes to be broadcast on the screen or for the guy to say it, and it happens every Sunday, and they're just stumbling over it like boobs, and you start to lose respect, right? Hmm. Mark? You know, before I respond, I, I've been keeping my eye on the chat, and there's some really interesting, uh, well thought out, I don't agree with everything, but... You know, um, we've talked a lot about the problem of authority in the church. Yeah. And what happens is there's been an inordinate authority that's been given over to the pastor and the people that are, you know, in the in the uh, in in the church are like the peons. And I don't believe that God's kingdom works like that. So what I'm trying to say is the people that are watching us right now, what you say matters. I'm going to go through this again and I'm going to read it again. And, and I'm definitely going to try to ingest it because there's some good wisdom there. But, you know, you're referring to what I would call throw the baby out with the bathwater doctrine. OK, mm -hmm. um, when you were praying earlier, something came into my mind at the beginning of this. It's, it, and I even wrote it down. We act like we are in a morgue and we call it sanctification. That's like the Catholic. There's there's the Catholic um, influence mm -hmm. again. So there's so many out there who believe that you, act, if you act contrary to that, or you have one belief that's contrary to what their <laughs> belief is, you might as well just throw this person out. You're never going to listen to them again. It right. takes spiritual maturity. First of all, to know that you don't have all the answers. Yeah. Second of all, just because somebody might disagree with you on a small point, doesn't mean you don't listen to them anymore. Doesn't mean they don't have anything good to say. So, I know that's not exactly responding to, to, to what you said, but I, I think that is such an important issue in the body of Christ. I just had to say it. No, it's well said. It's very difficult for a lot of us. You know, like I was in the church for decades on the platform. I was in the ministry first 10 years of full time and then part time for 20 years. And now I'm in the ministry again. But this time I'm sort of solo. But when I was in the church, um, it's just, it's very difficult to describe. Um, you know, I think there's, there's spiritual tests that we all face. And, and our leaders definitely face them, okay? And we know what those spiritual tests are. Jesus, uh, the enemy said to Jesus, if you are who you say you are, Take that that rock and make it into bread. So the first one is, are you going to try to use the kingdom of God to get provision? Okay. That's the one that I, I think Judas Iscariot hmm. started by failing before he betrayed uh, Jesus. Yep. And then the second one is, uh, throw yourself off this cliff and, and, and let the angels come save you. So the second one is, pray for... Pray for God to do things that are against his character. Put him to the test, right? Yeah. And then there's the third one, which I think is huge. All you have to do is fall down and worship me, and you can run it your whole way. I'll give it to you. It's mm. in my authority. I'll give it to you. So when you're talking about these leaders, I think some of them have sold out. And those are the people I'm really afraid for on Judgment Day. There may be a leader who in their mind... I'm going to contradict what I said earlier because you had said some of these people are defending the honor of God. And I said, not a lot of them in my experience, but there may be leaders 
who don't think that their their parishioners or the people that listen to them are ready to hear about the Bible changes. And maybe they're waiting on God or whatever the case. And I may disagree with that, but that's a lot different than someone who is not telling them or lying to them about it so they don't lose their ministry and they don't lose their name and they don't lose their livelihood and they don't lose their place in the community and all that stuff. That's a dangerous place. Well, yeah. I mean, we all know what the cost is. As soon as you start opening your mouth as a truther, you find out real quick <laughs> the response is not happy bells, right? And, and depending on your situation, you end up having to make a choice. So, uh, you know, the pastor has got an easy, It's there's no ambiguity with the pastor. He knows in about two seconds that if he goes, bites down on your little posse, what you're running with, I mean, it's hell on earth for him. <laughs> He's going to lose everything. I got to go to the district and tell them I'm telling my congregation the Bibles that the devil has his filthy fingers in Grandma's Gutenberg and uh, 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 the Bible's changing. Excuse me. <laughs> you know you got to have you got to have a meeting tomorrow at 9 a.m. and you're going to get your walking papers. And not only will you get summarily fired, you'll be branded as a heretic, lose your pension. You know. If your wife doesn't go with you, you lose your marriage. It may not happen. Depends on the church hierarchy that you're in. It really does. Uh, if you're in a less structured denominational scenario, you know what you can do is go to your your anchor families and get a buy-in. Because you know if people don't have an agenda, this is easy to see. It's only the people with an agenda that are super blind. So you get your five, six anchor families mm -hmm. on board, and then you um, uh, you approach whatever church government you have in your church, your board or whatever, and they either freak out or they come on board. And then you go to your denomination who has the power to fire you, if that's the case, which in many cases it is. Uh, and if they do, you just go start an independent church. And then I can guarantee you, especially if you start talking flat earth and stuff in the front of the room, which people are frothing at the mouth to hear about, uh, your church will triple in about 90 days. <laughs> It'll be the greatest thing to ever happen to your ministry, which is, by the way, on that note, uh, present, share screen. Let me show you another uh, initiative that we have launched. One moment, please. All right, this is our mastermind group for church leaders. Okay, if you come down here to the mastermind tab, click on that. This is our master weekly mastermind training and support webinar, which is reserved for Christian leaders. And it says, join our exclusive weekly mastermind group designed for courageous church leaders pastors, influencers, and executives in church organizations. This invite-only session offers customized training, Q&A, and support for those seeking to navigate through this difficult issue. If you're ready to engage and lead in this critical conversation, fill out the registration form below. Someone will contact you shortly for a brief conversation to confirm your participation. Then I get their name, email, phone, organization, their position, what type of organization and a description. And we will be here for the church leaders who have a come to Jesus meeting with themselves, with Jesus, and they realize that there's no wiggle room on this. <laughs> you, can't, mm. you can't deny it and you can't keep it a secret. Period. You're toast. Okay, so here is a uh, the vision for the outreach. And I just had this up here. Somebody posted the common thing. They say, no one, the affidavits are a waste of time. No one's going to respond to that. Only the ones that God wants to see will see. And I just stated that that's not true. 
the videos that I'm creating, the book, all of these things are, are coming into the possession of people that don't know this is happening and they're being exposed to it and they're accepting it. So it isn't true that only, okay, well, let's say, let me restate that. What you're saying is potentially true, but God will use me. How should I say this? It's true that is it's a spiritual awakening. It's a revelation that you get. But God will use me or people to bring the truth to them and the Holy Spirit will breathe on it, right? You follow me? It's, it's not this passive thing where, you know, you're just going to leave everybody to their own and not try to do anything. Because that's the message I get. You can't convince anybody, John. The whole, only those that God wants to see will see. Well, what are you trying to tell me? Should I just stop trying to, to share the information? What, uh, you're telling me I'm wasting my time. Yeah, that's what they're telling me. They tell me it's a fool's errand. And what I'm telling you is you're wrong. It's not. It's not a fool's errand, and, and you're going to watch it happen. And uh, so this will explain the outreach <coughs> here. And, uh, uh, you know, because what, what that position doesn't take into consideration is the great God Jehovah. I mean, you, you, you try telling that to Moses before he went into Egypt. Moses, there's no way that you're going to be able to convince Pharaoh and, what are you, you got a staff? What are you, crazy? So he started dropping uh, the plagues on him, right? Or, you know, the, the walls of Jericho. This is ridiculous. The arche archaeologists said that the walls of Jericho were so thick you could drive a chariot across them. And they were, I don't know how tall, and they said that they can't explain how, but they were pushed down into the ground. So I serve a mighty God. I serve the great God Jehovah that created the heavens and the earth. And he spoke to me right over there. And he told me, go tell my people that the Bible's changing. So what I'm expecting is miracles to begin to break out in our midst. Mm. And we'll go from 60, 70, 80 people to 600 and then 6,000. That's all it takes is people starting to get healed and people will start hearing about that. That's one thing. The second thing I'm counting on is the angel of the Lord. The angel of the Lord. What is that scripture? It says, Bless the Lord, all you his angels, who excel in strength and hearken unto the word of the Lord. So right now, Father God, in the name of Jesus, I pray that your angels would go forth to the north, the south, the east, and the west, and they would go into the Bible studies, and they would go into the libraries and the private studies of the church leaders and tap them on their sanctified shoulders and say, hey, do you see that email there? I need you to look at that. Mm. I need you to take that seriously, and I want you to call that guy. And this is going to humble all of the people that have tried to put cold water on what God is going to do. It's going to humble you. Because you're going to watch the salvation of God. God told me the preachers are coming. I believe him, mm. not you. You know, not only that, it, the, the notion of pragmatism is not scriptural. Because... God called Noah a preacher of righteousness. He preached for 50 years. Noah? I thought it was 100. Oh, I thought it might have been 100. You might be right. 100. You might be right. Something, 100. And, something. and he didn't have any success. Now, listen, I don't believe that's going to happen. I heard a pastor recently. <laughs> he made not. the argument that impossibility is a spirit that you need to arrest and bind. Ooh. So you know what? Right now, in the name of Jesus Christ yes. of Nazareth, we bind the spirit of impossibility over yes. this ministry in Jesus name. You are hereby bound, unable to operate, rendered a fet in Jesus name. I know the person that I amen, I amen that. Okay. I, I know that person that posted that is a friend. So I don't want you to feel uh, like, like, you know, rejected or singled out. Yes. Right? But, yes. but this is a really important 
revelation that I believe we all need to get a hold of. As truthers, we're very cynical and, and we're all like pulling the covers over our head when we should be taking the field. We're called to be conquerors, not to be conquered. Hmm. We're called to step onto the battlefield of our generation and, and change the course of history. And this mindset that nothing, you know, passivity, nothing you're doing is going to work is absolutely anathema. I mean, that is what you just prayed is, is absolutely right on. We take authority over that passivity lie and we bind it in Jesus' name. And, then, and so what I saw in the Old Testament was the, the kings who came into their position through the bloodline and it would say, um, and they did what was right in the sight of the Lord. So they honored God, but only the ones that pulled down the high places saw revival. Mm. And that is what God has placed in our hearts to do, is to go out, not just stay here and, and you know, minister to us, which is important, but to go on an outreach and to bring, and that's why I had to, I had to stop and do the book. And by the way, the, the first book took me six months to write, and it was 300 pages. And it was the hardest thing I ever did. Well, I, I remember thinking, I don't have six months. <laughs> I got to do this in three months. So for three months, I woke up and I worked on the book until midnight and I went to bed and I got up and I worked on the book all day and all night. And I did that for 90 days. And I wrote a 500 page book by the grace of God in 90 yeah. days. And now because I couldn't, I had to have all of this organized and codified into a book because people aren't going to go combing through these three-hour videos to find the answers. So now we got this resource. And, and so as we're going out into the battlefield, we'll be able to say, oh, well, that's on page 223. Okay, what else can I help you with? And we're just going to be, we're going to be a juggernaut. And, and, the, and the reason I shared those testimonies is that's why we're doing it. That girl that shared the testimony. What you said on the live stream changed my life. Okay? And any pastor that's going to value his financial security and his reputation over the souls of those people will, by God's grace, we will go to him if he rejects our message according to, I think it's Matthew 15, if your brother sins, go to him. If he doesn't receive you, you go and get another brother, and in the mouth of two or more witnesses, let all things be established. If he doesn't receive that, you go bring him before the congregation. If he doesn't repent then, you treat him as a publican. So what Jesus taught us was a process of escalating our interaction with somebody that's in sin. And make no mistake about it, if you're, if you're a church leader and you know this is happening and you deny it and you cover it up, you're in sin, big time. Mm. And we have a burden and a zeal for the house of God. We have a burden for the people of God, just like the testimony. And if you're not going to come and take whatever this means, then we're going to go around you. We're going to go around you. Mm. And we're going we're gonna to get the affidavits to get the appointments, but we're also going to hire a Christian social media firm. And we're going we're gonna to go to, let's say, a Bible college, and we're going to hand out books first to the, to the faculty and see if we can't identify some people in the organization that see this. Then we call the dean, and the dean says no. He doesn't care about my affidavits or me or anything. He's not biting on it, right? Well, what happens then is we contact the social media company and we, we have a, a series of ad copy and things that are going to go out to the constituents of the Bible college. All the students are going to find out that their Bibles are talking about people drinking their own piss and eating their own dung because they deserve to know. They're going to mm. find out that men are breastfeeding. They don't know it's in there. It's shocking to find these things out. 
Mm. They're going to find out for the first time that Jesus is telling them, if my if people don't follow me, bring them in front of me and slit their throats. I just had a guy email me, said he's in uh, Puerto Rico or Costa Rica, and his, his wife is, speaks Spanish. He speaks Spanish. So they looked up that scripture in the Spanish Bible that they have, and you know what it said? It said, he said, John, it's worse. He said, it says, Jesus says, if they don't follow me, bring them here in front of me and cut their heads off. Wow. 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 All right. So I, I did a talk a couple years back called uh, The Final Showdown Between the Mandela Effect Community and the Church or something like that. So there, there is an element to this of the Elijah conflict with the prophets of Baal. He, he basically called them out. He said, choose this day whom you will serve. And whoever answers by fire. You know what's interesting is. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. You know what's interesting? I'm sorry to interrupt you, John, but. No, it's okay. What did we learn from your discussion with Paul? Because here's a guy with 50,000 subscribers. And I like this guy from the second I, he opened his mouth. Yep. And almost all of them agreed with you. Well, why is that? Because all the characteristics of a kingdom emanate from the king. So if you're a pastor and you're operating in compromise and you're operating in some measure of selling out, your congregation, those that follow you and, and see you every Sunday and sit in your pews are probably doing the same thing. If you want to do right, start now by eliminating the compromise and, and, the, and the selling out in your life. Say that again. I, I heard the words, but All I right. didn't understand. So Paul, you went on Paul's channel. Yes. 50,000 subscribers. And mo the vast majority of those subscribers, who had, most of them had barely even heard about this, received the fact that the Bible is changing. They didn't, they didn't you know, uh, dispute you, or we didn't see any of this crazy resistance that we normally no. see. No, we didn't. Okay. Why is that? I su I submit to you that the reason is, I heard this from a guy by the name of Ed Cole, who he's dead now, but I really liked his ministry. He, According to him, all the characteristics of the kingdom emanate from the king. So all the characteristics of the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ emanate from the king. We're to be like him. If you walk into a house, you'll see that all that the characteristics of that house emanate from the father. If you work into a church, all the characteristics of that church are going to emanate from the pastor. So if the pastor okay. is operating in compromise, or they're operating saying. in sin, or they're selling out, of course the congregation is not going to receive it. But if, you were, if you're operating in compromise, you're operating uh, in sin, or you're yeah. operating in selling out, you can repent, <laughs> and, and, and hopefully that'll mean that your congregation will receive this when you bring it to them. It's going to be interesting to watch how how this plays out, how the folks um, we got so much to go through, but we're going to stop because it's it's two hours. So we'll pick up where we left off on, on Thursday because we never really got to um, what I wanted to share with Psalms 12 and all that. So we'll catch up next on Thursday when we come back. Um, Mark, I can't express how grateful I am for your friendship and your contribution and your zeal and, and what God is, you know, how he's just knit our hearts together on this. And, uh, what we have before us is so, I don't know what the words are. I mean, I, 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 I find myself just overwhelmed at the scope of this. And, and primarily because so many don't know it's happening, which seems so impossible to me. How could that be? How can that be? I don't understand. Think about it. Well, social media is not that big of a world. If there were more of us, people that are really talking about this at a, at a, in a biblical level, I think we'd know about them, right? I mean, YouTube... 
is the main platform. Facebook's got about 100 groups. Some of them have over 130,000 subscribers. One of them has a bunch of subscribers, but most of them are more like 15,000, something like that. But it's a lot of people out there. Uh, but most of it is either just sharing different changes or the pop culture stuff. So I don't know. I don't know of that many people that are really talking about this at a biblical level to the church. And I'm, I'm like, why? Why aren't there more of us? Why is that? Any thoughts? Well, speaking for myself, there was a long period of time where I would I said that this is the scariest thing that I've personally ever seen. <laughs> yeah. But it's interesting. I feel so blessed right now to be a part of this. I can't even tell you. I feel so you want to talk about a blessing in my life? You know, I've had so many people, I have a very similar testimony than you. They want nothing to do with me. They don't want to listen to anything I say. They don't give me, you know, they don't even, you know, listen to two, to me for two seconds. Right. You know, and, and you've, um, you know, you've, you've, you've treated me. Um, it's just a beautiful thing. You know, we have a great friendship and, um, we've learned a lot from one another and God is doing something that is just I give the Lord Jesus Christ the glory. This is, I could never have imagined this in my life. That's all I have to say. Me neither, brother. Well, thank you for for, uh, sharing your heart today. It's really a lot of really profound revelations and helpful insight and uh, all the chats and everything. Good to see familiar faces um, and friends. And uh, glad I'm back. And we do... We're, we're trying to commit to meeting regularly, so we're, we're shooting for Thursdays and Saturdays at 7. That's our goal, and we'll see how that rolls. So uh, be looking for those. Make sure you join the newsletter. Subscribe to YouTube, and um, uh, what else? Uh, please, if you, if you would like to help us, go get the affidavit and fill it out and email it to me. Just sign it and email it. You don't have to get it notarized if you don't want to go through that or whatever. It's not. It only takes a minute and it's free at the bank. But if you don't want to do that, just sign it and email it to me and I'll start to compile those and that will be incredible help. All right? And uh, thank you for your uh, financial support. If you can help us, that's also awesome. We do appreciate that. Just go to um, wakeuporelse.com, hit the donate button. All right? And there's links below as well. All right, guys, God bless. Awesome to see everybody. We'll be back here again soon. Mark, have a great evening. Thanks again, brother. God bless you. And we'll see you soon. Take care, everybody.